Hey, everybody. Hey, welcome to episode 23 of Pardon the Disruption. If you listen to our last episode, episode 22, we talked about Swarm AI. And if you remember from that podcast, we had a couple clips from Lewis Rosenberg, who is the CEO of Unanimous AI. Well, in this follow-up podcast, episode 23, I had the opportunity to sit down with Lewis and have an extended conversation. And what you're going to listen to and watch right now is that conversation. So I hope you like it and give us some feedback at the end. You're listening to Pardon the Disruption with your host, Tom Young. So so anyway, so tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you're doing this year. Uh, just adding on to, you know, piggybacking off of the tag thing. Like, what's new? What are you guys working on now? And where where do, where can we see this going for, you you know, Swarm AI and your, and your company? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, at Unanimous AI, we're, we are a, a really a very different type of AI company. And so, it's worth kind of giving that context. Um, because in you know, most AI companies are looking at how they can develop algorithms that replace people, take people out of, take people out of the loop. Um, there's certainly a lot of work that people do in areas of sports betting, financial forecasting, uh, sales and marketing forecasting, where they just look at historical data, big pieces of historical data, and try to come up with algorithms that, um, that can replace people. At, at Unanimous, um, we come at it from almost the opposite perspective. We, we start from the premise that people are smart. <laughs> uh, people are really smart. They have knowledge, wisdom, insight, intuition. They, they are continually keeping their data up to date. Um, if you're a sports fan, you're on, top of, uh, you're on top of sports, you're watching games, you're developing your own intuition about how, you know, how teams are playing. Uh, even live during games, you're getting a sense of you know, what is the momentum of the game. And those are things that don't exist in big data, but they do exist in the human database and in, in you know, people. And so what we do is we, we've developed uh, AI technology that allows us to, to connect groups of people together and maximize the value of their knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition. And we do that through a uh, software we call Swarm because it's modeled on how swarms in nature achieve this same remarkable feat. And by swarms in nature, I'm talking about uh, flocks of birds, schools of fish, swarms of bees. Um, this has evolved in nature many, many times because it is the way you could make groups smarter. And we allow groups of people to do that. And, and we've seen really remarkable results when we have groups of sports fans uh, predicting sporting events or groups of salespeople predicting uh, sales or inventory levels, even groups of financial traders predicting, uh, predicting equities. And, and again, it all goes back to the fact that people are smart, and if we connect them together in, in uh, really efficient ways using AI, we, we can make them super smart. Yeah, I, I read a book um, by a guy named Daniel Suarez uh, a few years ago, and it was called Kill Decision, and it was largely about drones. And it was a sci-fi book around the advancing drones and whether drones should, you know, should have uh, lethal decision rights in a military context. And so one of the factions in the book was driving towards the really advanced predator drones with lots of cool technology. But uh, in the book, what, the, the, what actually won the day was very low-tech drones, but 100,000 of them. And they had one weapon, but there was just so many of them, it just overwhelmed the enemy. And it took out aircraft carriers and all kinds of stuff. But what was interesting is they modeled the whole thing after uh, they hired a, a biologist who was a expert on ants. And they, used, and they basically used the drones. They actually used pheromones to communicate. So you couldn't jam their signal because it was all it – was, it was in the analog realm. But it didn't occur to me at the time when I read that that there was an, an, an innate knowledge through the, through the swarm intelligence where you're basically leveraging. So in, in, in your talk, you talked about how each of the points is like a, a, a equivalent to a neuron. And to the extent that that neuron's smart, like a person or even, an, even a bee or an ant, when you stitch these things together, you get this multiplying effect 
uh, through the neural network. Can you explain a little bit about that and how that works? And because what we're trying to understand is, I, I I agree with your premise that the people are people are smart and there's and they're smart in a way that machines aren't. And if we can combine the two, you can create something that's smarter than everything. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah. So absolutely. And and so your examples about um, about drones are are interesting and and they actually go to this idea that um, you know that. There's there's lots of really real value you can get when you look at things like ant colonies or bee swarms or fish schools. Um, biologists refer to all of those different types of groups as superorganisms because really they start to behave as a as a single intelligence. And, and the way nature and again nature's been you know uh, evolving this over hundreds of millions of years to find really what's the best way to, to combine insights from groups. And, and so if you think about any of these examples, like a, like a colony of ants or a school of fish, each individual has a slightly different perspective of the world, right? These, these individuals are out there in the world and they all have eyes and ears and they're seeing the world from a different perspective. They're, they're out there capturing information that's different. And, um, and, and that's really useful. Like they, you know, they're out there exploring, gathering data, and then how do you combine that data in the best possible way? And, um, and you know, what humans do, like if it, was, if it was up to humans, we would take a vote or we'd take a poll or maybe you run a focus group. Uh, that's not how nature does it. Nature does it by forming these real-time systems where the groups are really kind of pushing and pulling against each other and converging on solutions. And, um, Honeybees is, are, is actually the example that's best known in, in nature. Um, they've, they've been studied for about 50 or 60 years, and they, they actually have been shown to have this remarkable ability to amplify their intelligence. And so for honeybees, the, every year they have this very, very uh, important problem to solve. They need to find a, a new hive to move into, and it could be a hole in a in a log or the hole in the side of a building. Um, and, and the way they do it is they send out scout bees and they send out uh, you know, hundreds of scout bees that go out into the world and search for information. And they're all finding different options. Some of them, some of them are seeing similar options, but they're fi they find dozens and dozens of potential home sites. Now this is not that different than sports fans going out and reading all kinds of different articles about right. different sporting events or, or, or consumers out there searching for different products. They're out there collecting information. So the, so the honeybees go out there, they collect this information, and then they bring it back to the colony and they form a system where, and, and it's actually pretty remarkable how they do it, but they, they need to basically um, process the data together. And they actually do it by vibrating their bodies. And so uh, biologists call it a waggle dance because uh, the first scientists who looked at it, it looked like they were dancing, but they're really vibrating their bodies and that the vibrations are showing the, the strength of their, uh, of, of their support for these different home sites that they've discovered. And by uh, and they basically end up in this kind of tug of war where they're pushing and pulling and they converge on the one solution that they can best agree upon. And it's almost always the best solution. Um, biologists have shown they pick the best possible site over 80% of the time. And, and when they don't pick the best possible, they usually pick the second best possible. And, and, and if you were a human looking at the same data, it would be very hard to do. And so the question is, well, we humans, we're, we're just like scout bees. We're out there in the world collecting information. We all, you know, if it's, if you're sports fans, you're capturing different information about sports or, uh, or financial analysts, you all have different perspectives. We can use those same techniques. Uh, now we humans can't waggle dance like bees. Um, so we created this software, this piece of software called Swarm, which allows groups of people to log in. They can log in from anywhere in the world. It could be a group of sports fans and they can log in and they can, uh, work together to predict, uh, you know, predict a slate of, of hockey games, or they could be financial traders predicting interest rates. But they, the, the key is that they all have different perspectives. Inside the Swarm platform, they, they basically are engaging in this tug of war, pushing and pulling, and they converge together on a solution. And we've done studies with major universities, and they, the solutions are significantly more accurate 
than uh, had the individuals uh, worked on their own or, or had the individuals just taken a vote or just had a conversation. It, it's, you know, nature teaches us that, that if we allow groups to converge together, they can get the best, you know, they can get the best combination of their insights as opposed to just getting the average combination, which is really what a vote so would give you. I, I think, you know, one, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the, the things you must address is right, in Western culture, the primacy of the individual is somewhat in this protocol subordinated to, to, the, to the group. In the same way that I look at an ant, the ant's not the life form the colony is, and the ant is just part of the colony. So as when we have votes, we treat each person's vote equally. And even though mm-hmm. not everybody has the same perspective or the same quality of perspective, and this protocol tries to extract that, and, and I, I assume it's basically you're, you're weighting the votes through this protocol to come up with a better answer. Right. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. If I take a vote, I treat everybody equally. Um, and that's, that's great. In fact, when, when people join a swarm to answer a question, if I'm saying, you know, who's going to win the Stanley Cup playoffs, uh, and I have a group of 50 sports fans, I will treat, they will all be equal. Um, at least when the question starts, they're all equal. But here's the thing. Um, we, while we're all equal in terms of we all have equally valid perspectives, our levels of confidence are different. I might, you know, I might be really, really confident in a particular question. Somebody else might be actually unsure, right? And, um, and so what, this, what the AI is actually doing is it's watching everybody's behaviors as they're pushing and pulling against each other to determine at, at every moment in time which people are, you know, have high confidence, which people have low confidence, because their sentiments, their sentiments are not equal. They're, you know, they, as people, they're equal, but their sentiments are not equal. And, and I'll give you an example of how, to show you how powerful this is. We, we were challenged by Newsweek uh, a, a, a little over a year ago to predict the Oscars this way. And so, um, and so we, we just got 50 movie fans and we had them log into the Swarm platform. They, they, logged in, they can log in from anywhere. They just need a standard browser. And we had questions pop up who will win each of the different categories, best actor, best picture. Uh, and, and, um, and it's hard because there's a lot of choices for each one. And, um, and so these were just 50 regular movie fans. Um, and, and so they predicted each of the categories and we gave the categories to Newsweek. And then they published the predictions, which puts pressure on us. And, um, and the question is, well, how did we do? Well, as individuals, these, these people were 40% accurate in predicting the Oscars, which sounds bad, but it's, predicting the Oscars is hard. Um, then we can look at, well, what happens if those individuals took a vote? As a vote, they were a little bit more accurate. They went to 47%. And, and, and that makes sense because there is this, you know, this principle of wisdom of crowds, and crowds are, are smarter than, than individuals. They went to 47%. Then we had them work together as a swarm, same 50 people, and they jumped all the way up to 76% accurate. They went from 40% to 76%, almost double the accuracy of individual members by working together as a swarm. Now, now here's the really interesting thing. For the Oscars, there's lots and lots of data about how experts predict it. Pretty much every professional movie critic registers um, their predictions. And the average professional movie critic was 64% accurate. And so these, this group of just 50 regular movie fans significantly outperformed the professional experts. They outperformed the New York Times, the LA Times, Variety, the Hollywood Reporter. Now here's the amazing thing. We then asked those 50 movie fans, how many of you have seen all the movies? None of them had seen all the movies. In fact, most had seen less than half of the movies. But that's, that's the thing, they each have they, they each have incomplete information about the world. They've seen half the movies. Some of them have heard, you know, read articles online. Others saw you know, on the radio. But what, as a swarm, they're combining all those insights. And because people are, you know, you know, some people are confident in certain questions, not confident in other questions. Maybe, maybe it's a question about you know, who's going to win the best actress. And maybe they're confident about some of the choices, but not confident about the other choices. The, the swarming process combines 
and, and finds the different levels of confidence and allows the group to converge on the best combination of their insights. And it, it, it gives these very, very powerful answers. So what are, so, uh, it, it, you know, the first thing I thought of was, all right, you know, let's do the sports betting and, uh, you know, I'm sure it's a fairly sophisticated approach to doing that, but uh, let's talk about the business applications. W if I am in a business environment, where might I apply this to get better decisions for the firm? Like, what are some of the things you're working on in a corporate client? Because those are the, the 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 Oscars, the Kentucky Derby. That was the the one that really got you on the map. Th those are uh, proof of of concepts. But then now, okay, I want to apply this in decision making at the at my firm. How might I, how might I do that, and what's how does that work? Yeah, uh, it's, that's that's a great question, and and really, there's uh, the way we look at it is you can take a group of people, any group of people, and turn them into an artificial expert that you can ask questions to, and and then in business, there's really two types of groups that make sense. You can have a group of, uh, of internal team members. So if you have an internal team that's a sales team and they want to make a, a, a sales forecast, if they make that sales forecast together as a swarm, they will be significantly more accurate than if they used a, a traditional method. If they are a marketing team and they're trying to um, you know, predict which types of marketing messages are going to resonate best with their customers, you can amplify the intelligence of that marketing team. If it's an engineering team and they're trying to forecast uh, how long is a certain project going to take or, um, or which features are going to be best perceived by users, again, we can amplify the intelligence of that engineering team. And so we've seen lots of, uh, of corporate uh, teams basically come together inside a swarm and, and amplify their intelligence. The, the other type of group that's really interesting is groups of customers. So if I am uh, if I'm a, a big brand and I'm thinking about uh, launching an advertisement, uh, I can bring together swarms of real customers and have them give insights. And so we actually did a, a project that was uh, this was with a, a major fast food chain, and they were uh, they're going to be launching uh, new television ads around it was actually around pancakes. And so they uh, swarms of their customers. Uh, from around the country, uh, logged into the Swarm platform. In, inside the software, the TV ad would pop up. They could watch the ad, and then they could uh, ask a series of questions about uh, how people would react to those advertisements. And basically, they're interviewing this, um, this artificial expert that's giving them really deep insights about how people will react. And so in, in, both, in both categories, whether you're making turning a team into an, an amplified expert sales forecaster, or you're turning customers into an expert customer, uh, you can very, very quickly generate uh, really useful insights from, you know, from human groups. So is there a situation, I mean, I get that. So is there a situation where you wouldn't use this in a, cause to me, this is sort of like the next gen focus group. If I'm having, if I'm going to convene a focus group, uh, typically I'll put a lot of experts around that focus group in a controlled environment. And then the, the experts around the focus group will try to discern what they heard, what they saw and distill the feedback from the focus group to make decisions. And that's an imperfect science. This is sort of the technology that replaces that and makes it and, and amplifies it. So is there a situation that you can think of where you wouldn't use this technology in a focus group setting? Yeah, I mean, it. we see it as, as being actually a lot more powerful than focus groups for, for a number of reasons. Um, one, when, when groups come into a swarm, everybody's anonymous and everybody's equal. I mean, they're equal. Um, how they behave might affect the, you know, their, how, how their sentiments are being processed, but they're all equal. In a focus group, uh, nobody's anonymous. And you have this really big problem that uh, someone with a very strong personality can taint the whole the whole room, and and so you have moderators who are constantly trying to keep you know get quiet people to speak up and and very aggressive people to tone it down. But it but there's almost no way to prevent uh, to prevent the the insights from being steered very very strongly by by small you know one or two individuals. 
in a swarm, we don't see that. Um, and in fact, we did, uh, we see that also inside of organizations. In fact, we did a, we did a project with the U.S. Navy on a similar issue, which is uh, they, you know, they, they want to get good decisions out of groups of people. They, they, uh, they have uh, this issue of hierarchy, which is it's very, very strict hierarchy, which is if you ask a group of people a question, let's say that, and let's say these are technologists inside the Navy and you're trying to figure out what's, you know, what's the most important new technology to invest in, you have this issue that each person is, you know, in some sense, trying to second guess people up, up the chain. Uh, want to hear. Uh, once you allow people to be anonymous and, um, and you treat everybody as equal, now people feel empowered to actually be honest. And so we see that in corporate hierarchies. We see that in um, also just in a, in a focus group where there's personality differences. The other issue is that um, people don't actually have to get together in the same room. They could be spread all around the country or all around the world, and they can jump in and uh, and generate these insights. Whereas with focus groups, um, you have these other logistical problems. So well. give me a sense, uh, if, if I convene a group, how long would it take? Is it is it a half hour episode? Is it three hours? Right. So we um, we always recommend to, to businesses that are using Swarm to, to, to do a session in 20 minutes or less. Uh, just uh, only because people are, you know, we want everybody who's participating to really be focused and, and, um, and 20 minutes is a great amount of time. Um, each question that gets asked to a swarm uh, can get answered in, in one minute or less. And so in 20 minutes, you can get through 20 questions, usually more like 30. Um, you know, sometimes it can go to 30 minutes, uh, but we did, you know, it's, it's a fast, it's a fast process, uh, much faster than, say, a focus group, which usually runs two or three hours. And uh, in, in fact, uh, we're actually doing, uh, we're doing another study right now with um, the, the California Cybersecurity Institute uh, and, and also the U.S. Army, where they're looking at um, groups of cybersecurity experts and running them through these trials where they, they're, they have these um, simulated threats pop up on their screens. And then they have to prioritize which are the most important threats that um, that they're seeing and how should they react. And it's these kind of scripted scenarios. So they know what the right answers are. And the study has been looking at what if we have these small teams of cybersecurity experts who are going to prioritize using Swarm versus uh, uh, groups that are just sitting around a table and, and just discussing it. And what they found is uh, what they're finding so far, and it hasn't been published yet, it, is that the groups that can make decisions uh, using Swarm are doing it in uh, like half the time and are more accurate than the groups that are sitting around the table. Because sitting around the table, they're just arguing about it. There's not, again, strong personality could end up influencing the whole group. And so it is, uh, it is a way to allow groups to reach answers faster and more accurately, um, whether they're you know, a group of consumers in a focus group setting or, you know, or a group of cybersecurity experts um, who are who are just trying to again trying to find the best combination of their different perspectives. The, so if if I want to set up one of these sessions uh, with a client, do I do do I need to set up the questions in a certain way, or is this sort of like the uh, the magic genie? I can just ask it any the, the, any question and let the software take care of it. Or uh, my my guess my question is: Is there like some uh, expert setup that's required to make sure that you're asking the questions in a certain order to get the right answers. Right. Um, so you definitely want to ask good questions. And uh, in in our software, we have guidelines of like helping people understand how to ask good questions. But it's it's actually relatively simple. You know, our recommendations are things like asking questions, and and you would just your questions would just be you know a, a text question. Um, like, for example, in that cybersecurity example, the question was as simple as, you know, which of the following risks are, are the highest, you know, has the highest priority, right? Very, very simple question. A lot of thinking that goes into it, but a simple question. Um, so we, you know, we have guidelines recommending how, you know, how you can keep questions simple. The reason of keeping them simple is that the, the most important thing, and it's, again, very simple principle, is to, to ask a question where you can feel confident that everybody will interpret the question the same way. If, every, if all the participants interpret the question the same way, 
then you will get good results. If, if different people think the question means something different, then, um, then you could get results that, that um, where the group has a hard time reaching an answer. And usually if the group has a hard time reaching an answer, you can go back and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe the question wasn't clear. And you can then ask the group and you, then it becomes apparent. But, so it's, it's definitely not rocket science. It's easy to, to, um, to ask good questions. But it, again, it, it, it's as simple as you know, formulating, uh, formulating a short question, formulating a set of options that they're going to choose among. And then, um, and so the, and again, the way our software works, uh, any, any team can just, like we actually just last month launched a, a subscription service where, um, where companies can just subscribe to the software, invite in their own teams, ask their own questions and do it all themselves. They don't need any, they don't need any expert support from us, um, to do it because it's, it is, uh, it's yeah, we, we reviewed the pricing. I mean, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is because as management consultants, this is a tool we would use to, to solve a problem. And right. what, what, I, what I'm tr trying to figure out is the wrappers that go around this because it, it has to do with uh, convincing them to set it up and, and to look at things differently, uh, to be open to the possibility mm -hmm. that they, they actually should act on the outcome and be confident right. that – the answer is going to be better than, say, their own individual gut or the the gut feel of their staff team, as opposed to getting a broader perspective of the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can see a tremendous amount of applications here, and so so let me step back and ask you, like, where do you think this is going? I mean, because uh, immediately my my thought was this could kill sports betting. I mean, if I if I if I if I were to get twenty five or fifty handicappers and and say, hey, let's do this and let's keep the results private and then we'll use that and capitalize on that, I, I wouldn't want to be the sports book that's betting against these guys using this technology. So um, I, I agree. Uh, there's and we've seen we've seen uh, really powerful results that way. And you don't necessarily even need 50 handicappers. It could be you know, as, as small as you know, 10, 10 to 15 handicappers can give, give really, really good results. We, had, um, we did a study with Oxford uh, looking at um, groups of people predicting uh, English Premier League football games, uh, which is, I, I believe is the most bet upon sport in the world. And, um, and so what we did was we had uh, just groups of, of regular sports fans. These were about 20 people and they came in and they, they predicted, um, they predicted uh, all 10 games for the week, every week for 20 straight weeks. So it was, it was a long-term study uh, done with Oxford predicting all 10 games as, as individuals, the, the uh, they were, 55% accurate in predicting the games, which actually sounds pretty bad, 55%, but in, in, uh, in English football, there's actually three outcomes. It's win, lose, or tie. So right. it's, so 55% so is, is not bad uh, in that when they work together as a swarm, these same groups of 20 people, they jumped up to 72% accurate in wow. predicting, predicting games. Um, so really, really powerful result. We did uh, we did another study which we looked at um, at NHL where it was uh, also twenty weeks of predicting hockey games. And this one we actually had tasked the group to to determine to actually pick which which teams to bet on. And so there was a simulated um, uh, pot of money. That, that these groups would, would bet on. And when they worked together as individuals, when they were working as individuals uh, across 20 weeks of predicting hockey games, they on average uh, had a 41% loss in, in betting on hockey games. Whereas when they worked together as a swarm, they had 170% gain across 20 weeks. And, and that's actually a published, both of those are published papers that you can find on our website, which actually goes through uh, the rigorous uh, analysis of those um, of those studies, but we see, you know, over the long term, uh, groups uh, can be really effective at, at predicting sports. And again, it goes back to this fact that 
people are smart. Yeah. And um, and a group of people can be smarter when we combine their insights than you know the expert handicapper that they're they're betting against. So uh, the, the qualification to participate in the swarm, you want somebody who um, at least has a perspective, right? So if I were to use the school of fish, at least the, I want to use the fish and not uh, something that's not part of it, like a starfish, it's not part of the swarm. So I want to have a, <laughs> some qualification to be a member of the swarm. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the qualifications of how you do that? I mean, you want to yeah, screen the users. For, absolutely. So for sports, um, we absolutely want people who who know something. The more they know, the better. But um, but there's uh, you know one of the reasons we focus on sports like and I should say when we did this study of, of English soccer, the participants were actually all Americans. So these were Americans uh, predicting English soccer. Which actually which, which is interesting about that is that. When we ask for participants, and these are people just who participated over the internet, if you if you say you're a sports fan and you say you're a you know an, an English Premier League fan and you're an American, you probably really are a fan. Um, whereas if I say if I ask if you're a, a football fan and an NFL fan in, in America, you know everybody thinks that they know something about football. Uh, Amer every American thinks they know right. something about American football. Whereas people who, who and so. You know, trying to get people who are true fans is really is really useful. Um, and um, that said, we've done studies where we've looked at groups of sports writers versus groups of fans. And what we actually find is groups of fans actually perform better than groups of sports writers, which is which is counterintuitive. And the problem here is that if you're a sports writer, you've trained yourself to always make the unusual pick because nobody will read your story <laughs> and if, you, if you're just picking the you know the obvious solutions nobody will read your story uh, and so you're always pick you're always picking the unusual pick uh whereas fans are actually just looking for you know who's like who's most likely to win period and uh, and so there's there's definitely um there's definitely more than just the level of knowledge there's also you know people who are um you know sports fans or maybe uh better calibrated. They know what they know, they know what they don't know, and when they work together form, they have a really good result. Uh, sports writers maybe are, are uh, think they know more than they really do and, uh, and are not as well calibrated. Well, don't you, also have said, the, we, don't you also have the issue with sports writers is that they have, there's a bit of a group think or a concentrated perspective. It's not a broad perspective, whereas a cross section of fans have a broad perspective, and you know the sports writers are, are are a clique within that larger body, and they only see the world from that world of the sports writer. They don't see it in a broader sense. So that at that level, just architecturally, they can't be as smart. Would you agree with that? Um, absolutely. So um, one of the things that we find with with swarms of people is that diversity of opinion is is important, meaning you really want people to have different views, different perspectives, different expertise. If, um, if everybody's in an echo chamber, uh, because they're, they already have the same exact views, then they're not going to be, there's going to be less amplification of intelligence. It doesn't mean they can't be experts. And, um, and so we've seen really good results, take a group of experts and make them super experts. Um, a study was just published by Stanford, uh, uh, Stanford Medical School, where here the, the study was to look at groups of doctors and have them diagnose, these were radiologists, and have them diagnose chest x-rays. And so um, they came into the SWARM platform. And again, these are radiologists. They all went to school for you know, 12 years to become a radiologist. They're, you know, they're very extreme experts. You would think there's not much improvement that, that we can get. And yet when we had these groups of radiologists come into the platform and, and diagnose chest x-rays, they reduced their errors by over 30%. So they had, uh, so even experts can get significantly smarter. And, uh, and again, these radiologists, they, you know, even though they're experts, they're well calibrated. They know what they know. They know when, when to not be confident. So they're not overconfident. They're just well calibrated, and so I would distinguish them from, say, sports writers who maybe make you know, their profession is to be overconfident, yep. right? That's 
that that is kind of what their job is to be. Whereas a a, a doctor, you know, their profession is to be, um, you know, very sensible. <laughs> so in, in the world, you mentioned the medical world, in the world of on oncology, when they get a really difficult diagnosis or something very difficult, they'll convene an, an ontology or on oncology rather, uh, review session where they'll get a group of people. This is a per to me. This seems like a perfect application to use a uh, swarm in that environment, where you you let a variety of doctors look at the case, and and then and and then not you let a dominant doctor in a focus group setting to control the outcome of that diagnosis and uh, do it in a way and where you actually leverage this. And uh, have you done anything like that where they, you know, these, where they've, you know, the re, you know, you know, they've convened oncology boards and they get stuck, you know, have you, have you tried it right. here? We've not, but it's, it's something that we've, uh, that it's, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great idea. It's something that we've been thinking about. There's, you know, there are tumor boards and there are other treatment planning boards where you have groups of doctors getting together and it's a perfect application, especially when the group's are people from different disciplines, right? So if you have, um, you know, a radiologist, an internist, a, a, an oncologist, they all have different backgrounds, all have different perspectives, and uh, and the challenge is how do you combine all those different perspectives? It's it's a uh, it's a great application, and uh, and we do, you know, the medical space is one that we're interested in. We have projects right now with with Stanford Medical School and and Harvard Medical School. Um, and and this is definitely on the, the roadmap. This this idea of um, you know, tumor boards and other other uh, group decision boards. Well, Lewis, I want to be I want to be respectful of your time. I, I certainly appreciate this further background. I, I see uh, us absolutely putting your stuff into our kit, and uh, mm -hmm. it's an exciting um, conversation that we have with prospects. I was just at. Uh, I was at an event at BlackRock uh, Financial in New York, a humongous uh, financial company, and we I talked about this in one of the roundtables. And uh, very everyone, you know, they've all heard it all about different things, but everyone was very fascinated <laughs> by this because they had not heard it before. And this notion right. of uh, leveraging nature and biology and, and using those protocols to make – and again, I go back to what you said at the outset, is there's a whole dystopian side of emerging technologies, especially around AI and automation, that that people feel like they're being made obsolete, and we get a tremendous amount of resistance from the affected personnel. Well, this is a situation where we, I'll call it a positive energy uh, project, where we're, we're making people more valuable uh, with the deployment of, of an effort like this to make a better decision on behalf of the group, as opposed to obsoleting them, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's um, there's so much energy going into to replacing people with with algorithms, and yet it's it's short sighted because it doesn't appreciate the fact that that people have this really vast amount of information. And you know, sometimes you call it intuition, sometimes you call it instincts, sometimes you just call it experience. But it's real. It, it's you know, those are very real things. And, and in, like you know, you give the BlackRock example in the world of say financial forecasting. You know, you can you can look at big historical data set about you know, and let's say you're trying to predict interest rates. You can look at you know, 20 years of data about interest rates, but you're missing the context of what the world feels like right now. And so I can take a group of financial analysts and they know, you know, they know what Trump tweeted on, you know, that morning, like that's going to affect their, like the AI doesn't know that the, the historical data doesn't know that the, the people, they know the context, they know the, they know the sentiment of the people they know, their family, of their other coworkers. And so all of these, you know, all this contextual information that we take for granted because we just absorb it the machine learning systems lack. And so um, when we take groups of people, whether they're financial traders or sports fans, and we, 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 have, we amplify their intelligence, they start to realize, hey, there's you know, this intangible human you know, intuition is really, really valuable and, um, and allows us to outperform these just straight algorithms. Yeah. 
Well, this is an exciting topic, and and again, we appreciate this. I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you guys to, to set up some commercials when we get a, a project uh, that's going to move forward yeah. with this. And I look forward to, to running some of these things and giving you some feedback on uh, the evolution of your product. Is there any last things you want to tell us about, like where – are you, I assume you're heading uh, what I'll call horizontal expansion, trying to get more use cases on what you're doing. But what about uh, vertical, the new things you're doing in this space? Is there anything new that you're working on that you can tell us about? Uh, so for us, um, the big thing we're focused on is um, is making it as easy as possible for for business teams or, or sports groups to, to use, use the technology without needing uh, – lots of support from us. And so one of the big things that we've really transitioned to this year is, is launching our software as a, as a SaaS platform where people can just take subscriptions right. and, uh, and then do it themselves. And so we're, we're pushing really hard to make it as easy as possible for, um, for groups to do the things they want to do um, with, with very little training and so we're focusing on you know the different types of use cases like forecasting. Lots of groups want to do forecasting. We've made that very easy. Lots of groups want to do prioritization. We've made that very easy. Uh, and then uh, we're looking at other kind of vertical. You know, there's groups that want to be able to look at you know inventory uh, management, and we're we're making that easy, etc. And so as we as we expand, we're you know we're we're looking at you know, the most common uses and. Um, and just trying to make those as, as easy for groups to do as, as they can. So let me, let me let me give you one last thing, and I'll let you go. The um, imagine the possibility of the future where I in the protocol we have that you described today. I'm bringing all these people in with a a a, a varied but sort of common perspective around the, the world, uh, but looking at it from different parts of the of the school, if you will. Uh, and then we're leveraging that intelligence uh, across the the entire swarm. Imagine now we start to replace the people with competing AIs. So look at a hurricane model where you have all these, you know, mm -hmm. 15, 20 models predicting the, the path of a hurricane. And now I put uh, these AI models or these compu advanced computer models in a swarm competition or a swarm co optetician, if you will. And ask those right. things, and, and to come up with a swarm answer to twenty predictive models, to see where it's. Now, have you done any? Have you given any consideration of a machine participation in swarm? Uh, we have, and and for us, um, what's what's particularly interesting is is looking at having people and an AI model interact together together in a swarm. Meaning, uh, you could have. Um, you could have a machine model that, that has value, but you still want to get advantage. You still want to take advantage of human insight. Right. And, um, and so we've looked at um, having swarms and, and you as the person might not know, you know, which, which is the AI and which are other people. Um, but we see that as um, it's definitely a, a valuable path forward. And it's, it's part of the, the R and D work that we're doing. Well, again, th Lewis, thank you for your time. We pr very much appreciate it. We'll be in touch. When we publish this, uh, This we'll, we'll certainly let your people know. We we just published, I think, yesterday. with Jordan, we do it yesterday? Oh, this, yeah. we, did, we, we did the first one on Swarm AI, and I think you're featured, and we, we grabbed some of your TED Talk, and we talked a lot about that. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, we'll get that link off to you. It's on YouTube and iTunes and whatever you listen to, you listen to podcasts. But we just put that out there, and, and it was a pretty spirited uh, conversation, so it was pretty good. So we'll let that, uh, we'll, we'll get that to you, and then when we publish this, we'll, we'll reach out to you as well. But we look forward to working with you in the future, and thanks for your time today. All right. Yeah, yeah it was fun, uh, and uh, look forward to working with you guys as well. Hey, thanks for listening to Pardon the Disruption. We'd like you to subscribe to our podcast if you like it. You can find us on most of the platforms where you get your podcast from, whether that be iTunes or YouTube or whatever you're on. Uh, we also want some feedback. What shows do you want us to cover? What do you like? What do you not like? So that we can do this. We're doing this for you. We're not doing this for anything else. So please subscribe and give us some feedback. Thank you very much.